Hey everyone, and welcome to this special episode of the Sam Taylor Podcast. My name is Keshav and I'm the producer. Today's conversation is with Sam's colleagues, Laura Cumming and Tammy Carroll, who are all professors of accounting at Dalhousie. They sat down together to discuss the early stages of their careers, how they have progressed, and some of the challenges and doubts they experienced with pursuing a CPA designation, then called a CA. They also shared some of the most rewarding and difficult moments about being a professor and how they got into the roles that they are in today, among so much more. I think you'll really enjoy this episode. It's a really special one uh, with Sam's colleagues and a lot of fun to listen to. Thanks and enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, first off, I would like to acknowledge that Dalhousie is un University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. So welcome. My name is Sam Taylor, and I'm delighted uh, to introduce to you um, Tammy Crowell. Uh, Crowell. Crowell. Rock and roll Crowell. Um, she is a CPA. <laughs> CA, and I'm really wondering, Tammy, what was your path to becoming a designated accountant? Hi, Sam. So I did my then CA with KPMG about a year after the merger, and it was a really exciting time at that point in time. We just moved into new offices. It was super fun. Everything was booming. So I was in KPMG Halifax office in assurance. And I did my two years then. Back then, we did two years, and then we wrote after that. And what was really exciting then is that the day you passed, you were a designated CA. So we didn't have what? to wait. Yeah. That, that, is, is that is really exciting. Yeah. I did not know that. Um, so was it because the months were counted way beforehand, or that was, that was just kind of like, hey, the big thing is that you wrote and passed the UFI? So back then it was more streamlined. Uh, you had to do pretty much, unless you did an Ontario graduate program, you had the two years or 24 months of hard time, I guess. And then you wrote and you found out in December. So at that point, for most people, their time would have been in yeah. and they were designated then. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. And I, I would agree that definitely way more different permutations and combinations and options to get to a similar um, path, um, which is both great, but also can be a lot really confusing. And mm -hmm. a number of our podcasts have actually been centered around <laughs> into the different paths and the different options and the different timing. Um, so that is fabulous. Um, I'm going to ask the same question. Um, what was your path to becoming a designated accountant to our other guest, uh, Laura Cumming, the person that I did not screw up her last name? By the way, there was much practice beforehand about this, and I will never, <laughs> ever, ever get it wrong ever again. Rock and roll, Tammy Kroll. Uh, so with that being said, uh, Laura, same question to you. Um, you were a CPA, CA. What was your path in getting there? Well, it was really similar to Tammy's, actually, but just uh, a couple of years afterwards. So I was a Dow BCom grad who then went to KPMG in Halifax in assurance. And I, I did my CA there. Uh, somewhere between Tammy and I, it went up to 30 months. I actually didn't realize it was 24, but I had, after I received my designation or after I passed the UFI, I had six more months at uh, KPMG, another busy season before I exited KPMG, not that it wasn't a, a fabulous experience, but 30 days on the nose uh, uh, is when I ended my time there. Wow, we have a lot more in common um, than I really realized there because I did 30 months and two weeks. Ah. So that was my time, sir. <laughs> you did two more weeks than I did. <laughs> I don't know. I had a little, little bit of a nudge because I wanted to put in my time before, um, before uh, December because I didn't want to have to like be the person that left right before busy season. Um, but I was, if I would have waited two weeks, then marks would have come out. So there's a little bit of a gamble there, which will likely come out um, in our subsequent discussion. All right. So I want to talk with all all three of us and start off with a silly opener. Um, I'm going to throw this to you first, Tammy. Dogs or cats? Oh, dogs, definitely. <laughs> in the room with me right now, I have two of them. Yeah. 
Um, and I know that a big delight is um, sharing your dogs with other people. So I knew that that would be perhaps a gimme. Laura, dogs or cats? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Neither. Neither dogs or cats. <laughs> animals? Goldfish? <laughs> I, I have an appreciation, I think, for animals. It's cool to, you know, see other people's and give them a quick pat, but uh, there, there are none living in my house, so. Oh my gosh, you what you just said is how I feel about children. <laughs> yeah, I, I like other people. Yeah. I like to give them a good pat and <laughs> there's none living at my house. Uh, so yeah, I can relate uh, with that a little bit. So your son has um, a pretend dog, is that correct? Or it oh, didn't gosh. Yes, my 10 year old. Well, Finn was nine at the time and he really, really has had wanted a dog for a while. And, and my husband and I both like, again, someone else's dog. Oh, cute. Great. Like, let's pat it. But I don't want one living in my house. But anyway, so I figured that if I told him, all right, well, if you can prove for a year that you can wake up before school and do a half hour walk with an imaginary dog, then we'll think about it. And neither Chris or I ever thought he would do that. He and Chris used to argue every morning about getting out of bed before school, but uh, he is stubborn and tenacious and you know, credit to him, he did it for a year. So I, I will be getting a dog in the coming months. It's a tense topic in our house, but. Ooh, okay, sorry, I'd like to start off with the drama. No, not for me, more for Chris. <laughs> So, um, all right, so we're all CPACAs, and yet um, I think we have a little bit different histories on what brought us to Dell um, and what brought us together as being colleagues. So perhaps, Tammy, would you like to start off and say what brought you from, how'd you get from KPMG uh, to Dell? So for me, I never planned this career. It really, really wasn't something I ever thought about, uh, but the university where I did my undergrad needed someone on the fly. Someone had quit and they literally called me probably the third week of August. It's shocking that they remembered me. <laughs> Not really. Uh, I, I talk a lot and most people <laughs> know that. They called me out of the blue and that was before email and all of that kind of stuff and said, hey, we need someone. Will you come? So I started teaching part-time. I did that for probably about a year or so. And then the same university had someone who was supposed to do full time and they said, we need you or we need someone, will you come do it? And that's how I started thinking, well, this is just a contract position. And then years later, Dell needed someone again in a contract position. And uh, I went for a couple of years. I actually taught Laura. She was in my class and she was my TA. So we knew each other long before our Dell days as colleagues. And that was a long, 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 long time ago. But anyhow, that was my path. <laughs> so how long were you like, how long were you contracting before you ended up working at Dow full time? So like I did total. contract, uh, at St. Mary's for three years. And then I was sort of part-time and having babies and whatnot. And then I did, uh, about a year and a half contract full-time at Dow back around 1999 or 2000. And that was all they needed me for. I came back full time in the job I'm, in the predecessor job I'm in now in 2007. Gotcha. And yeah. and at what point? Because you are involved heavily uh, and still are uh, with the profession, the accounting profession. So mm -hmm. how did you get involved with um, education from the CA school uh, point of view? Uh, it was a Mark's night party, and I'm sure I had had a few beverages and I went up to Bruce Dunsmore and raved to him about how great I thought he was and everything and how I would love to work with him and he was running ASCA the predecessor to CPA Atlantic at the time and I don't know if he just thought that I was a strange person or that he'd take <laughs> a gamble but he hired me to do work for ASCA and uh, his Densmore Consulting was just taking off about the same time and then I started also doing some work for him and then it just kind of grew from there. So one of the reasons why I kind of point out all of this is that oftentimes people see where we're at right now or see where you're at and they think it's a very linear path or that you do one thing and it led to the other. But really you did several things at several times and led a life and, you know, built a family and you know, grew your children and raised children. Um, so it was a compilation of a lot of things. Um, Laura, same question to you. What brought you uh, to Dal as a prof? 
Oh my gosh, definitely not a linear path. Um, I, I left KPMG with no other plans. And as time went on and I, I thought maybe something would magically come to me like, oh, you'll figure it out if you're not working and you have time to think about it. But it just gave me a lot of time to think about, oh my gosh, what are you doing? So eventually I got to the point where I have to try something. And I, when I was in university and high school, I used to like teach aerobics and teach swimming lessons and do day camps. And I thought, well, I like teaching. And I figured I'd never get a position in a university without a PhD. So I moved to Maine and I did a Bachelor of Education, thinking that I teach in the public school system. And then I came back to Halifax and I started substitute teaching, which is a, an interesting experience. Uh, I was in a lot of different grades and a lot of different communities. It, uh, yeah, interesting. And I have a huge, huge respect for public school teachers. And at the same time, there was an opportunity uh, at St. Mary's University to teach part-time. So I thought, sure, I'll, I, I taught audit there as my first course. And side note, when did it go from Bruce Densmore to Dan at ASCA, Tammy? I didn't know Bruce was ever in charge. Uh, Bruce, I maybe I said that wrong. Bruce wasn't in charge of ASCA. He was in charge of what was then UP Prep. And well, right. Dan was the executive director. So I probably said that incorrectly. Bruce was running UP Prep, the predecessor to the CP. And of course. He was the KPMG Marks Day event. And I started talking to him. I understand. Yeah, that makes total sense. So Dan Trainer, who was the executive director at ASCA at the same time, reached out to me and asked me to help uh, with things he was doing with the Atlantic School of Chartered Accountancy. And as, as the months wore on, I just realized that the the university CA preparatory course kind of teaching was just much more suited to, to me than the public school system. And then a, a contract came up at St. Mary's and it was always year to year. Mm -hmm. So I did two years there. And then after the second year, both Tammy, who had been at Dow in, in her current position, uh, for one year, and Joan Conrad, who is no longer at Dow, but was my prof as well when I was a student there, they reached out and thought there would be an opportunity at Dow for it to be permanent, like not being renewed every year. So I jumped at the chance to come back and and be at Dow because that's where I went to school, loved Dow. Tammy and Joan were both uh, profs that I thought were fantastic when I was an undergrad student. So it just... You know, people, when people talk about their career and their path or whatever, there's always a lot of uh, focus on hard work and, you know, what they did to get there. But a lot of it's luck, too. And I was just so lucky with how the timing worked out of what I was trying to do, because I know of a lot of other individuals who aren't uh, from the Ph.D. path who, who wanted a, a career like we have. But the timing was just never there in terms of universities. Uh, hiring people in full-time roles with our background. So I got super, super lucky and I'm grateful for that. I'm going to push back a little bit. I'm going to say not luck, not that you're wrong, but you're wrong. Um, it's fortunate, right? Um, you have the skills. You both have tremendous skills as educators, both care, um, and you put yourselves in really good positions. And you had multiple streams of income, multiple streams of skills, working with the profession. Literally, Laura, you have skills that you can teach anybody from probably preschool up until, you know, <laughs> 72 in the profession. So you have a, a, you know, you both have a really broad skill base, broad and deep. And then an opportunity came up that matched it. That was a fortunate opportunity. Um, and then you took, you also then took advantage of it and said, yes. Because sometimes people will have something, um, you know, it will be not it'll be presented, but then they don't go for it. Because you know, it can be scary mm -hmm. to you know walk into a classroom at Dal, especially when you were a student sitting there and be on the other side and be like, "Wow!" And Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, but you wouldn't exactly classify yourself as an extrovert. Is that correct? Oh, correct. Yeah. So definitely quiet. <laughs> So, you know, we're all fortunate to be here and to be colleagues, but um, I, I really, you know, want to 
you know, ensure that we highlight your, both of your skills and your ability to put yourself in that situation. But I will admit that there's a lot of different things that had to play out in order for us to all be colleagues and all be sitting here today. Um, and so similar to the both of you, I worked in uh, professional education um, prior to coming here and an opportunity opened up um, that, you know, was very fortunate uh, with the timing as well. I, I just, and Laura, what I like that you highlighted is that many people do want to be in our roles. Uh, many people want to be in our colleagues' roles, right? There's there are not a lot of academic jobs, PhD or instruct, uh, PhD qualified or professionally qualified roles. Um, so we are speaking from an area of privilege. And uh, part of this talk is to tell people about how we got here, perhaps give them some insights as to what we do, what we aim to do, um, what we sometimes aim to do and are still working towards doing, um, but also not trying to sugarcoat and be like, oh, there's a dime a dozen of these, or I did this because of only my hard work, or there wasn't a team full of people survive. Like, we want to be transparent about that. Um, Definitely. There are, there are many factors. Yeah. So, and one of those factors are that um, even though your tremendous history and skills and ability, um, you still came on and were renewed contracts every three years, which is something I don't think people realized. And both of you had a series of renewable contracts. And then after you had proven yourself for years and years and years, another opportunity came up and then you became full-time fac full permanent faculty, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. And yep. then over the last few years, you both have risen into the ranks to not only have your full-time faculty roles as senior instructor, um, but you're now both university teaching fellows, which is um, parallel to full professor at a university. So I just want to take this moment to acknowledge that tremendous, tremendous accomplishment um, to each of you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Laura's probably like, I hate this more. <laughs> like, what are we doing? Okay. Um, so that's how we all got to eventually know each other. I started working here in 2018 and um, was, um, yeah, just blown away by the depth of our colleagues. Um, so what I'd like to go into now is really, for me, what was kind of a pivotal moment in our relationship and our kind of getting to know each other a bit more. And that was, in my opinion, the COVID-19 shutdowns. Would you say that's <laughs> accurate? Yeah, <laughs> it was a lot. Yeah. So um, it was a lot. And unfortunately, um, we're recording this on December 16th um, of 2021, um, where our final exams were just moved online. So, you know, who knows what the future will hold. Um, but one thing I am grateful for is that um, I'm, I don't have to figure it out by myself. So Tammy, um, not that any of us would wish for COVID-19 shutdowns or anything like that. But were there any glimmers or good things that came from um, that shutdown um, from March 2020 to present, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, it, I'm very lucky because where I work at home, I have lots of space and sometimes glitchy internet, which isn't always <laughs> sometimes barking dogs, sometimes yelling kids. But I really like what I've done this year is instead of sitting in my office at arbitrary times, which sometimes works during a regular school year, but I've been able to say to my students, hey, if, if you need me, just ping me on Teams and if I'm free, I'll jump on. And I have not made myself available 24 seven, but I have had conversations with students at night, on the weekends, at various times, which has worked out really well because if you're a student and you have a question, sometimes you want it answered as quickly as possible instead of having to wait until Tuesday's office hours. And because I live out of the city now, for me, that has been a huge, huge game changer in terms of how much time I have, because I feel like I can still be available without having to be physically present in my office. So I like that. I like that I can uh, just on the fly kind of post a video and that's normal now, whereas before it might have been what? A video? We go to class and that's it. Now everybody is I think it's really brought out a lot of good in people that they're way more accepting. It used to be that if I was on a meeting like this, that I would be, I don't know, maybe a little bit stressed about everything being perfect and maybe having to go to a library or my office or something to make sure that there was no extraneous noise or anything. Now it's the norm if a kid walks in or whatever. And we're all trying our very best here to be as quiet and professional and everything. But if something happens, something happens. And people are way more accepting of that now, I think which is really good. Completely, completely. Yeah. Um, Laura, how about yourself? 
any things that stick out to you as being kind of good things or glimmers of awesomeness from March 2020 to now? Well, Tammy said it really well, and there, there's not much that I have to, to add to that. I, I will say that there were certain, I always would have done videos, but in terms of the need to use additional technology, I've learned a lot over the past 18 months, things that before I would think, oh, it would be good if I knew how to do that in Brightspace or if I knew how to use this tool, but it just never made its way up to the top of the to-do list, but you were forced to do it during COVID, which felt a bit stressful, yet at the same time, now I just have a broader range of things that I'm able to do in a face-to-face -face classroom or a remote classroom, so that's nice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I am not, intentionally trying to kiss your butts, but um, my biggest thing from this is really getting to know and be supported and um, accept being supported by the two of you, right? Um, so we each, when I came in, I definitely, um, you know, I was an experienced educator, but it was also my first time teaching in a university setting. So I was grateful that each of you opened your classrooms and I could observe a class before starting teaching the students myself. Um, I knew that you were always there and available, but you know, when you're, it's a different dynamic when you're not new, so you feel like there's an expectation to know things, and perhaps you do know things, and perhaps you do have your own opinions, uh, but definitely the pandemic was an opportunity for me to collaborate and open up and be more vulnerable with each of you, and you both stepped up, and I am so, so grateful for that um, because it's just made my time and my, I think, teaching practice that much better. Uh, and yeah, just just funner. Like it's nice to you know hop on a group chat and share a text about something that's related or unrelated to what we do. And it's just been um, something that I've really valued. Uh, Thanks, Sam. Aw. and like this. Could you not? No, like not to put you on the spot. Aw, um, but could you imagine doing this back in like mm, I don't know June of 2018? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just because it wasn't the norm then, you know. Like now it is more so. Yeah, it wasn't the norm, um, and yeah, it would probably be like just if, in my opinion, I'd be like, uh, like a little bit stiffer. <laughs> like now, I'm like, I feel like I can ask you all anything. I feel like you trust that you know, it will, um, it'll flow and it'll be relatable, and we'll just have a chit chat. So, in your opinion, Laura, COVID, in person teaching, on virtual, all these other things, what is um, just in general the best part of our job as Dal Prof, Dal instructors? Oh, the students. Students keep you young and, and thinking about things. And it's it's fun to be a small part in people of that age. Like, and people always say about children, oh, it's such a fun age, right? Five-year-olds or eight-year-olds or whatever. 18 to 23 is a fun age, right? It's new adulthood where you're trying to figure out who you are and, and what you want to be and to be able to assist with that or just witness it is really cool. What about the worst? The worst. Loop back to me on the worst. No, absolutely. Uh, Tammy. In Sorry, your Tammy, if you're not ready for that question either. No, 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 no. I, I am... I am asking the hard uh, questions. Uh, Tammy, what, in your opinion, is the best? The best for me, I mean, I echo what Laura said, absolutely. But the best for me is that without fail, there is not more than a couple weeks ever in my last, I don't know, 10, 15 years that goes by that I'm not hearing from some student about what they're doing now, <sighs> thanking all of us for being a part of it. Or, I mean, recently on results day, uh, hearing from students who, oh, thank you so much to all the Dow profs that were part of this, you know, really appreciate it. Or even just, you know, I have former students who will say, hey, I'm gonna be in town, would you like to get together for a coffee? Or if I would go to teach in Toronto or something, students getting five or six of them together and we'd all go up for dinner. And I would just think I am, so lucky to be part of this, you know, like that is just so awesome that I'm constantly getting this affirmation that I'm making a difference. And look, it's not all roses and sunshine. Every day is like that. I 
also have had some negative experiences of students who haven't all been as lovely with their comments, but that's fine too. You know, you can't win them all. But I feel like I'm making a difference. I feel like, what is that Pavlov's five hierarchies? I'm going way back now. I'm way, way, way back. But oh, there's, there's uh, Maslow. Some... Maslow and yeah, that, yeah, the self-actualization is at right. the top. And I can remember uh, doing some jobs and feeling like, you know, this is just not doing it for me. But teaching is doing it for me. It was, it was what I was meant to do. I'm lucky. We're fortunate. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So for me, it's when I taught in the profession, um, I would get to know students over two days for a workshop or two months. And then all of a sudden they would leave. And sometimes I would see them again, but oftentimes I wouldn't because Calgary was a big uh, center. And so it was like getting, it was like reading a book and like, you're like, oh, this is a good book. And then somebody takes it away and then gives you a new book to read. And it happens like that for like three or four years. And I'm like, okay, I am ready to like read a whole book. I'm ready to like see the Harry Potter series through. And I would also see students um, at CPA that were at the beginning and they were like really strong university students. They knew their stuff, but they couldn't apply what they knew. Like they had the skill set couldn't apply what they knew, um, couldn't add value to the users, couldn't time manage, and um, then really had kind of a crisis of self. You know, I would see their self-efficacy -effic um, impacted, which then would impact their performance because when they're self-guessing themselves, they're not, you're not going to perform as well. So um, I, my whole thing was really, I wanted to make a difference by helping to bridge that gap. So it wasn't university CPA or perceived, because we all know that it isn't necessarily, but perception and try yeah. to contribute to this. Um, and one of the things that I love about us at Dell is not only do we coordinate being fourth year profs amongst ourselves to make sure that we're not throwing in tax fine or tax midterm and audit midterm and an IP <laughs> midterm all in the same like day or week. Like we, we talk, we communicate. Um, we often, you know, Laura and Tammy, you guys have done crossover cases. Tammy and I have done a few different crossover cases. Um, so we get to work together and integrate and support and doing so, we also bring in our CPA um, backgrounds and knowledge because we're all still very much tied into the profession in either you know, in one aspect or another, not going to blow anybody's confidentiality agreements here, um, but we're able to take our skills and basis and weave them into undergrad to really work on that self-efficacy. So Tammy, to your point, when I hear from students, hey, I feel so confident. Hey, I feel like I have the skills. Hey, I see how what you taught us applies to now. Mm -hmm. Sometimes keeping that long-term perspective you know, when they're like, why is this so hard? And I'm like, listen, it's going to be hard anyways, but at least the way that we're teaching it makes it so that you don't have to relearn it again in, in the new program. As 90% of our Dow grads tend to go on, accounting Dow grads go on to some sort of graduate or CPA level. So that's what I love is knowing that we are a part, a small part, or, you know, um, of, you know, helping uh, yes. to, to shape that um, skill set. And for me, I'll just tell you, because um, I know I put y'all on the spot, I'm going to again about the worst part, but I will say that the worst part is that there is no, well, there are very, a lot of metrics to judge um, what performance is based, looked like on us. There's no kind of blueprint. This is how you prof. Um, oftentimes <laughs> students don't know. Did you know that students came up to me and they're like, until you told us that you have to go to meetings, I just thought that all you did was prepare our classes and teach our classes. And I am like, Whoo, that is the best part. That is why I do this. And I'm like, but there's all these other things that I have to do in order to have the privilege to be here. So I started telling them about all the service commitments, about all the meetings, and that our job is really 60% teaching, um, which has felt, you know, at times during COVID slightly but, um, and then 20% to do with the profession and 20% meetings and, and um, service and other uh, committee requirements. And they were shocked. So for me, um, the hard, the, the worst, not the worst, yeah, the, the toughest part, the worst part of the job is that, you know, you're balancing all these things. You're and that there's no blueprint to balance and that, you know, you're never quite certain, am I doing everything that I can be doing? Am I doing everything I should be doing? Am I doing, you know, where, like, what is like the end? What is the goal? And that, that uncertainty is something that um, I've definitely been more affirmed with saying, hey, 
I know that Laura and Tammy will let me know if I'm falling short. Um, <laughs> and on top of it, they'll also tell me when I'm doing a good job. And that's really nice to know. So Laura, am I, am I okay to circle back to you and ask you what the worst part of the job is or should I bug Tammy? I thought you'd forget, but apparently not. So <laughs> the, I hate to call this the worst because in some ways it's the best. And Tammy highlighted how it's the best in the sense that we have a lot of flexibility. So if we have to take our child to the doctor in the afternoon or just want to go for a walk in the afternoon, it's, it's quite possible to meet with students in the evening instead or on the weekend. Uh, and that's really nice. It's nice for family reasons and personal reasons. But it also, at least in my own experience, sometimes it results in me never being able to shut work off. And students have that expectation now, right? Where if an email is sent Saturday morning and they're used to me replying to emails Saturday morning, but I still haven't replied by Saturday night, then there's a follow-up email or I'm at the hockey rink trying to, you know, watch whenever my son comes on the ice, but I'm also like half the time my head's down marking tests. So sometimes I feel like it'd be nice to have a job like my sister, who's a nurse, and she is on for her shift and it's, it's definitely challenging. But when it's her days off, there is no, like, there's no nursing to be done or there isn't the guilt of, oh, I know I have a few emails. Should I, you know, not do this and reply to them now? Or, and, and some of that, I could do a better job of just setting boundaries, right? And saying, okay, any emails received on the weekend, I'll reply Monday morning. And I don't do that. But finding that kind of balance between how flexible to be or where to set aside personal time, I find a bit challenging. I can relate to that. Tammy, I'm going to uh, shuffle the hard question on here. What's the worst part of our gig? Yeah, you know what? That's really true. And before I was a prof, I probably would have thought the same as what you said students have said to you, Sam. I would have thought, oh, that's a really great gig. You know, like you go and teach your class and you're done and you get the rest <laughs> of the day. <laughs> yeah, and, I know. And, and that's, <laughs> you know, that's what these and, and, you know, it is great that it's flexible and that wasn't going to be my answer to the question. Uh, I'll get to that in just one sec. But, but yes, I think that because sometimes people will see me out walking in my sweatpants or with my dogs or whatever, that they think that, oh, well, you work part time. I get that all the time. I get that from my friends or family that like, you know, my mom will call, well, you don't have to work today, right? And summer's <laughs> off. They assume that oh, you're doing nothing all summer. Right, right. So there's that. But what I was going to say, I thought back to something. You know how when you're in high school, they always ask you for like your quote or something like that to put in the yearbook? So at 17, my quote was, what, what bothers you the most about people or something like that? And in my high school yearbook, it will say, I despise it when people lack ambition. At 17, I put that as my yearbook quote. <laughs> Because I was that person. I've always been that person. Laura's laughing because she's known me for a lot of my life now. <laughs> and it's true. And honestly, that's what really does kind of get to me about students is I think all of us are all over trying to help students as much as we possibly can. But for me, one of the hard parts of the job is when a student isn't trying and then, then they're looking for something at the end of the term. And that might tie into your last question too, Sam. I know you were going to ask some questions about advice to CPAs and all that. And it's just, you know, like put your best foot forward because it, now it's it's starting to count. You know, like it might not have counted when you were eight or nine, you could pull that I'm a kid, but you know, like try your best or at least don't not try your best and then put it on somebody else that it somehow becomes their problem. We've talked a little bit about this end of term. We always see this with students and that's kind of what, that's probably what I spend time thinking about laying awake at night thinking oh you know this person may not pass or may not do well but then i stop and say but whose fault is that right so that's that's what keeps me awake at night yeah that is so relatable uh sometimes uh when i remember i start my classes with saying you know hey welcome i'm pretty friendly and outgoing or you know that's what i like to think of myself and then i say you know after the preamble I'm like, okay, and you know, just to let you know that nobody, like, I don't feel anybody here. Like, I don't feel anybody. And there I go, they get all excited because they hear like it's a hard course. And then I'm like, people fail themselves, and mm -hmm. I hold them accountable for those failures. 
And yeah. then the mood, then it, it turns, shit turns real really quickly um, because that is part of it. We can joke, we can have fun, we can work hard. You know, some of my funnest memories are also where you're just like so tired that you're trying to get this like stuff done as, you know, props or as professional accountants. And, but you are with a team or you're with other people and you're getting through it. So um, it doesn't, just because it's hard doesn't mean it can't be fun, but just because we're having fun doesn't mean we also are working hard and taking it seriously. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, it, and it does suck at the end of the term when you're sitting back and you're looking at these results and you're like, there's, you know, students have, in order for our degree to be worth something, to communicate something, to have the skill set for students, um, they need to meet those those measurable objectives. Um, and so I agree that that can, it can break your heart, right? I think we've said that offline that, um, you know, this can be one of those jobs where, you know, you can't really turn off caring. They, you know, students can't do have the ability to make you smile and break your heart. Yep. Sure. Okay, let's, let's turn this a little bit around a little bit because I want to get to know each of you on a personal note a little bit more. Um, what does fun look like for Tammy Kroll? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, like, there's so many different ways I could answer that. But some of the things I like to do, I mean, I'm not 25 anymore. When I was 25, I'd have a completely different answer. To <laughs> but, but honestly, like a fun day to me is going on a new hiking trail with my dogs and my husband, or going out for lunch with my kids, because my kids are, are now older. Uh, you know, like spending time with people. It, it's the same answer when people say, well, what can I get you for Christmas? I don't mm. need more stuff. I want more experiences. I want to do things. I want to go places. I love to travel. I used to love going on cruises. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> uh, for my 50th birthday, my husband planned a surprise trip to New York for me. And that was probably the most fun ever, being able to go eat great meals and go to theater and, and just walk Central Park and stuff like that. So for me, fun is planning new experiences and doing stuff like that. Fabulous. Laura? What does fun look like for you? Well, really similar to what Tammy said. I like to do things, get to yoga classes, hikes. You and I did uh, stand up paddleboard yoga stand back in September, which was a new experience for me, I think for you as well. Yeah. That was awesome. Uh, I'm down. <laughs> You're invited. I was invited. Next, invited. I said, Next no. year, we'll all, we'll all do it, all three of us. Yeah. Uh, and spending time with my family. We all ski and snowboard in the winter. So hopefully, well, there's a little bit of snow out right now. Hopefully there'll be more and we can all do that together. And with the travel, I mean, I concur as well that my family, the five of us had a trip in the works uh, for a month in New Zealand this winter, which is obviously not happening. Their badass prime minister who's done a great job with, well, with a million things it seems, uh, but definitely with COVID. She is not letting us in. So maybe sometime in the coming years. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I find this one interesting. This is a question that has come up from our uh, students and recent grads. So they ask, what are your future plans or options that you're considering? Uh, and I know, I feel like, Laura, you've heard this a few times from students who will, you know, inquire and they'll be like, and I, I tend to think that these are from students that are like, wow, like you're amazing. Like, are you, are you planning on profiting for the rest of your life? Or like, what do you want to like be the prof boss? Or like, what is it, what does it look like? What is next? Um, so, you know, as far as future plans go, I feel like in the short term, um, this might be a little bit of a different answer. Um, as in Laura, what are you doing next semester? Um, so you can answer this and what are your future plans? What are you doing next semester? And what are your greater career ambitions? If, uh, You'd like to share that? I I think, uh, Sam, that you were referring to when I was recounting the story once of a, this was several years ago, but a student, I think one of their projects was to take uh, someone out to lunch whose career they admired and interview them. Is this what you were Oh, doing? yes, that, that is part of it. Yes, absolutely. So, a, a lovely girl and very smart and competent. And we went out to lunch and talked about how I got to where I was. And then when her, her question came up of, well, what about in 10 years from now or 20? Like, what are your 
what are the things you want to achieve in the future? When my answer was kind of status quo, like I love profiting. I love that you just made it a verb, Sam. <laughs> I, I, I continue profiting like at at Dow. I, I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing. And 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 she was like, well, you you mean you'd never want to be the dean or or that's not what you're hoping for someday? And and the answer is no. And I I feel like she might have a little bit been, been thinking, oh man, I shouldn't have picked Laura for this. <laughs> this is a bad answer. <laughs> she was very surprised, right? Because I think a lot of us, um, which is fine, have the idea that you should be always striving for the next promotion or, or the higher salary, or that it should always be some kind of linear traditional path to success. Mm. Whereas I'm, I'm happy what I'm, with what I'm doing, and same, which is great, a great place to be in. I, I would absolutely just highlight the fact that um, it is perhaps not the answer that she was looking for, but the answer that she needs to hear. And I feel like um, more of us, like uh, definitely myself uh, 10 years ago, should have, would have loved to have heard something like that. Not necessarily for the immediate answer, but for something to kind of chew on as I work throughout my career. Because, you know, as somebody who, you know, blindly was kind of like, what's next, what's next, what's next? And like looking to accumulate in either status, career points, um, roles, or, you know, something else earlier on, and then realizing, what now? Or like, what, what is there? Why am I doing this? Instead of just, oh, this is what you do. Um, coming out and, you know, hearing that story that, um, that you said. And I also want to highlight that within our roles, like Laura, you have grown and you have contributed so much to our university. Same, same with you, Tammy, within your role. So the ability to make an impact and grow and support colleagues, you know, in the teaching community of practice, which you lead, Laura, um, Tammy, you uh, lead a national um, CP prep program. So we are able to have large impact within our current role and current umbrella mm -hmm. and shift and pivot. And I think that's something that perhaps what people would traditionally see as moving up or making an impact would have a, a change of a job title. We're really fortunate that under our current role, we're able to have that flexibility and have those opportunities and, and go for that. Would that be fair? Yeah. I mean, just to add to that, I'm at the stage in my career now. I can. I think that being over 50 is pretty empowering because I can step back and say, titles don't mean anything anymore. You know, like to me, I'm, I'm on the other side of my career now, which isn't to say that I don't care about things or don't want more and don't want to do better. I do. But for me, like I'm having a good day if I can sit back and say, you know, I reached somebody today. I made a difference to them. Or I changed something up in my course that I think is going to be really useful. Or someone reached out to me that they passed core one and they were really happy that our combined courses worked. Like I don't need a title to be redemption. That that just doesn't matter to me at all anymore. Yeah. Love it. And Laura, the other reason I was asking you about that is because uh, I wanted it to come out that next semester, you are taking a sabbatical, which yeah. is uh, lovely and not something because we are in a very unique um, kind of roles. Only not a handful of universities. It's becoming more and more prevalent with the AACSB standards, recognizing the need uh, and encouraging universities to have both professoriate stream PhD qualified candidates, but also you know people that have lived and worked um, in the accounting profession that we're training um, our DAL accounting grads to go in towards. And so something that's unique, um, relatively speaking, about down the country is that we do have faculty tenured positions for instructors, for uh, professional accountants that we are all in. And that because of um, the roles in which you uh, both are at, you have earned uh, sabbaticals and you are executing um, the right and that privilege um, of a sabbatical. Laura, you're taking one next term and Tammy, you will be taking one in the fall. So um, I just really want to celebrate that because uh, I know that I, I definitely don't take enough time to acknowledge like cool things um, and, and share necessarily because it feels somewhat self-congratulatory, but like what an awesome, awesome accomplishment. And because you're going to be able to take some time to sit back and focus on projects which add value to not only your own teaching practices, but also enrich in my teaching practice and the teaching practices of our colleagues at Dow. 
So that's really exciting. Thanks. It is exciting. Definitely. Thank you, Sam. So, okay. This is a popular question from students. Uh, <laughs> do you, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to throw it out there and then throw it to one of you, but do you regret completing your CPA or CA at the time? Uh, Tammy, do you regret completing your CPA, CA? <laughs> no, I mean, that's such an easy answer. Uh, I never planned to do my CA, CA back then. Uh, I was headed to law school. That's what I wanted to do. And I wrote the LSAT. Uh, accounting was completely plan B for me. Never, ever thought that I would do this. And uh, it just opened up so many doors. There's so many things that you can do with it. And I think that maybe students in high school or younger uh, pre-professionals don't really get that. I think that there might be a misconception about what accountants do. And um it's really opened up so many doors for me. And most of my friends who are my vintage, they don't do debits and credits. And I think that that's a necessary evil to get to the more exciting, interesting jobs. So, um, you know, anyone who's thinking about accounting as a career needs to understand that it's, it's really, it's like learning to walk. You can't run and hike and explore until you know how to walk. And, you know, that's what intro is all about. So I, I'm really happy I did my CA. It's, it's really, really been great for me. How about you, Laura? Well, it's a path that led me to a place in my career that I'm thrilled about. So from my 2021 perspective, absolutely not. There, there was a period of time when I was working on my CA where, and even afterwards, where I felt like it was definitely a mistake. I can remember sitting in UFI prep, it would be CFI prep now, and they were talking about how uh, the UFI was the entrance exam into a fascinating profession. And my colleague um, turned to me and he goes, don't worry, Laura, it's your exit exam. You're close. Because I said I was <laughs> going to finish, like I wanted to, to finish and get the letters. Um, but that would be it for me. And when I did get my 30 months in and then I realized, OK, well, I, I quit and now I don't have a job or income, but I also owe $1,500 in professional dues to enter, like, and then I'm gonna have to pay that every year. At that point, I thought, oh gosh, like, is there even any point of me paying this? I'm jobless and I don't think I want to be a CA. And I, I wish I could remember who was CEO of the Institute of Chartered Accountants at the time, but he reached out to me. I don't even know how, I didn't know him. What? He kind of convinced me like, you know what? I think that you might take some time and, and you, you may come back around. So I'm going to waive this for you. I think it was for a year and let's get in touch in a year. And he, wow. and he was right. Um, anyway, so for a long period of time, yes, total regret, but it worked out. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that's something that's super important to share is that it's like, just because we love where we're at right now and are grateful and thankful that it's not all smooth sailing. Um, there was mm -hmm. one Saturday night that I recall back and I, sometimes I feel guilt, um, or I used to feel guilt being a prof, training people towards possibly being, um, you know, future CPAs, because I remember, I, but then I, I feel more solid in it because of this, of, because of just radical transparency throughout. So if there's an opportunity in class to, you know, where it's, where a student asks me, what is articling really like, or what was it for you? I can say, you know, there's been a Saturday night where, you know, um, I received some news. There was perhaps some like poor uh, communication, um, you know, and I'm the junior sitting in the cubicle, I'm crying her eyes out for an hour and a half at 8.30 on a Saturday night. And then kind of laughing because I have to keep working because I can't leave until this work is done. And I'm receiving some really bad news. And, you know, and, and realizing, okay, what can I take from this moment? Um, I will never make somebody feel like this again. And then wrestling with that guilt of, am I putting students to be in a destiny like that? And the thing is, I would have still gone through and done all of it again. Um, even during it, even not knowing what it would lead to, um, and even if somebody would have told me. So, but what would have been cool is if somebody would have told me, and I would have had you know an experience, or I would have had some tools to better equip with some sort of feedback that was received, knowing that you're not alone, knowing that you know as a junior on a job, you cannot blow the budget so bad that you ruin it for everybody. You're a junior. 
Your job is to show up, have a good attitude, and do your best. Uh, that is our job really generally in life, but definitely as a junior, if your audit is blown up because of the junior, then you had some shitty planning and some shitty leadership along the way. And to make a junior feel bad about that is not a reflecting on the junior. So being able to provide context to this and saying, you know what, um, full transparency, they're not all going to be easy days. Um, I think it's worth it. If you think it's worth it, then go for it and surround yourself with people and opportunities um, that can make each day a little bit better. And you know, just as many bad days, there are also good days. Um, but like you, Laura, um, I, I I finished up my C, CA at the time, not thinking I was going to use it. And then um, had a, having some small opportunities and finding um, the empowerment through that through that designation and really re making it something for myself. So sometimes it takes time. It's not all sunshines and rainbows, right? Yep. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you. Uh, circling back to what Tammy alluded to that I was very curious about before, um, about having advice for current uh, DAL accounting majors. And right now um, we are in between third and fourth year. So we will um, be having a new batch of uh, third years coming in, doing cost accounting, doing intermediate financial accounting one. Um, Tammy, what advice would you have for current DAL accounting majors, either in their third or fourth year, or perhaps aspiring DAL accounting majors? Well, I think I started to talk about it a little bit earlier. And, and for me, uh, it's, it's making sure that what you do from here on out that you're doing the best at and that you're thinking carefully about how you conduct yourself because, you know, you're going to see all of us. Halifax is a small community. There could be fellow students that might be your employer someday. You never know. So I just think that it's important to always be positive, to be professional, to be thinking ahead about how your actions now could affect you later. And, you know, I think there's something we put in, in our various course outlines that says something like, we understand if you need to prioritize something else and you miss a class, that's okay. That's life. I mean, hey, if I don't get to something now, I have to do it later or I have to figure it out. That's all fine. But that becomes something that you have to figure out. It doesn't then become someone else's issue. So just being more aware of how your actions today could impact the perception that others have of you and, and making sure that you are acting as a pre-professional. That is pre-professional. Yeah. Um, Laura, same question to you. What advice would you have for current or aspiring Dallas County majors? I agree with what Tammy said completely. Um, as a, a specific example of that, uh, I regularly receive emails to questions that are very clearly answered in the course outline or technical questions that that are very explicitly stated in the notes that I gave them. I love student questions, but th there should be a little bit of effort to find the answer or or you know be responsible for the content and what we're sharing with you before everything is just, immediately email Laura and that carries forward right when when they're in the workplace I really hope that we graduate students who read the partner's email in detail before rushing with a question or doing something that contradicts that I saw a funny story that kind of relates to what we're talking about the locker and the fifty dollars right yes yeah. <laughs> Where in, the, in the course outline and i think it said it was oh. only a three-page course outline which isn't it's way shorter than ours yeah. so in a three-page course outline the prof said first student to this locker here's the combination there's a treat for them and it was a fifty dollar bill and at the end of the term the fifty dollar bill was unclaimed <laughs> I know of a prophet Dow who um, she has a, a song that she wrote called Check the Course Outline and she plays the guitar. And anyway, whenever a student emails with a question where the answer is explicitly stated in the course outline, she sends them the link to that YouTube uh, video of her singing with her guitar. And I think that's such a, a light and easy way of reminding them, right? That it's right there for you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, as a follow-up to that, um, we were fortunate, uh, I believe Tammy, you mentioned a few uh, at the beginning of this, that uh, we recently had CP Marks. So we have a whole bunch of you know, new CPAs out there. Uh, Laura, as a follow-up to your advice to uh, counting majors, what piece of advice would you have to these recently designated CPAs? My, my advice goes back to what we were speaking about earlier, about how, and one of you made the point that it's not always a linear path. Right, life is a is a winding road in a lot of cases, which is what I tell our our Dow students. You're not necessarily always going to take the next step, whether it's in your professional life or your personal life. It's not all going to go exactly as planned or at exactly the same pace. And I think it's important to be able to still enjoy your life or be content with where you are, right? Rather than always like, well. Ugh, I want that promotion. Things will be fine once I'm promoted or things will be fine once I'm married or like, you, you have to enjoy your life where it is, which can be a hard thing to do, right? I've definitely been guilty of thinking, oh, I, I wish things were like this or when I was in my 20s, absolutely. I wish I was in a career that I liked or that I could figure this out. Um, yeah. I think you bring up a good point. Oh, I'll be happy when I buy this purse, I'll be happy when I get this car, I'll be happy when I get this role, I'll be happy when I do this, this, this. It's like, no, 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 be happy now, right? Um, surround yourselves with good people and have goals. And that's something I know that I still challenge myself with is being both grateful and ambitious. Um, and I, I feel like it is, it, it is possible, right? To be both grateful and happy and to both have things that you're working towards and um, knowing that it, it's okay to have the pull and it's okay to be completely, um, to have different types of goals. Um, but the major thing is if you feel like you'll be happy when X, Y, and Z happens, chances are from my personal experience, and it sounds like from what you've seen or observed or perhaps felt that there's no, I'll be happy when, it's I'll be happy if I can acknowledge where I'm at now and then work towards, or perhaps just acknowledge where I'm at now. Would that be fair, Laura? I think so. How about you, uh, Tammy? What advice uh, would you receive? Would you give to the recently designated CPAs? So, I think uh, I think something that I would say is be memorable in a good way, and and that sort of echoes on to some of the other things that I was saying. But a different example. So, you know, something I I tell my kids is when you start a class in university, make sure that the prof knows who you are, not mm -hmm. in a stock up way, but just in a, Hey, my name is Tammy. And you know, I just want you to know who I am, that sort of thing. That sort of thing is what led me into teaching. I mean, along with a, a series of other being at the right place at the right time, like Laura said, and being lucky, but the harder you work, the luckier you are. Joan Conrad said that in her convocation speech a couple of years ago or something similar to that. And the idea is, is, you know, people need to know who you are in order to remember you to reach out in the first place. So, you know, just as an example, if, if, a, if a few people apply for a TA job and one of them is someone that has made a point of talking to me in class and being that good student or whatever, uh, then I'm going to look more favorably upon them. Or I've had students accuse me of favoritism before. We all do. And I know it was Joan who said something like, yeah, it's kind of ironic that the students I like the most are the ones that work hard and come to class and show up <laughs> and roll. Like, yeah, of course I'm gonna like those students better. So it doesn't mean I'm gonna give them a better mark, but it means that I'm gonna have a positive attitude about them. So just be memorable in a good way. Go out of your way to come prepared to shake a hand, well, maybe not in these days, but you know, bump an elbow. <laughs> <laughs> to introduce yourself, to volunteer, to get outside of your comfort zone, things like that. Yeah, the little things really can be the big things. Um, this semester, I was in a classroom where sometimes overflow uh, chairs would be needed. And I asked the students at the beginning, like, hey, if you come use an overflow chair um, before you leave, would you mind putting it back? Um, and, you know, often, like, every single day without, without, um, without missing one, um, there was these two students that would stay after um, and 
um, and put the extra chairs away. Maybe they saw that one of their students, one of the fellow students had to move off. Um, but they stayed behind and they made it like their mission to ensure that I, in addition to some other closed down things, um, that there weren't these random chairs about. And those little things, um, like I, I notice and I'm grateful for that. And I try my best to acknowledge it. So, you know, they stood out and it's not about, you know, these grand gestures, but it's like these, these little things that do, do make a big impact. We've had, so I did survey the students. So a lot of the things that we're talking about today um, are items that I was curious about. I thought maybe our audience would be curious about, but also that the students had said that they wanted to know about us or understand um, kind of where we are at, how we got here, and also what our thoughts are for the future. So one of the questions that came up that I'll attempt to answer first and then throw to you, Tammy, is that is there, um, they suspect that we all enjoy um, teaching in person. And that's likely because when we had the option to be online or in person in the fall, we all said, if possible, we would love to be in person to deliver our fourth year accounting classes, to make those connections, to really um, empower our learners in the way that we can connect and make the biggest impact for what we feel. So the student asked us, um, is there a sustainable hybrid model for classes at Dow going forward and what that could look like? So as a closing question, I would say, I don't know. We're in early days. Um, I, I know that flexibility is key and being able to um, demonstrate resilience um, is, is something that I know that I try really hard to do and, and hopefully that comes across. Um, Tammy, what are your thoughts for the possibility of hybrid models going forward? So I echo that, except I'm, I'm always concerned about uh, online being the mainstay. And while that can work in some models, particularly if you're talking about executive levels of education, where it has to be, where people are working full time and need that flexibility, that's fine. But I know myself, my feeling is, is that I really, really want to be in the classroom with the undergraduate students at least. And I enjoy teaching the MBA class in person as well. So I would be very careful about this turning into something that's permanent on a regular basis. A lot of students, especially the younger students, want that in-person experience. And I hope that that is something that the powers that be reflect upon very carefully. Yeah, I agree. All right. So in closing, um, in tradition with this podcast, um, by the way, thank you so, so much for being so generous um, with your time. Uh, Laura, I'd uh, like to ask you, what is your definition of success? I think you're successful if you're enjoying your life, right? If at the end of most days, you feel like it was it was a win, like you enjoyed time with someone you care about, your work went okay. Um, it's a pretty simple definition of success. At the risk of uh, crying, my mother-in-law passed away last week and I, at the wakes, I got to meet so many people. She was a, a high school teacher. I met former students, people who she volunteered with at the hospice. I met people who knew my father-in-law, who I never met. He passed away 22 years ago and was also a teacher. And there were people talking about him and telling me about um, about Mr. Brown. And, and all of the comments were around how they, my mother and father-in-law made them feel. Um, so if you can make people feel good about themselves. I mean, it left a lot on me last week to think about for sure. Thank you. I didn't even cry. Jazz hands. Yeah, <laughs> yeah jazz hands. Um, Tammy, how about yourself? Oh, um, how, how do I you follow up with that? <laughs> I know. Yeah, I mean, just being happy at the end of the day. Like there's so much surrounding metrics and you know, what's your title or how much money do you make or where do you live or what fancy car do you drive? And it's so easy to get sucked up in all of that. And I think when I was younger, in my 20s, I cared a lot more about that stuff. You know, I can remember working for KPMG and back in the day, that's when we wore suits. We wore suits to work. Laura, do you remember pantyhose? I don't think I always wear pantyhose. But we wore pantyhose and heels and suits. And, and that's great for people who do. I mean, look, no disrespect. If you're rocking that, that's awesome. But, you know, I, it, or my kids will say, oh, so-and-so drives this car. How can we have our crappy old Tucson that's five years old? It's because I don't care. 
I yeah. don't care. That doesn't matter at <laughs> all to me anymore. It's like Laura said, you know, like, uh, I'm happy in my life. I'm happy with my kids and my husband and my amazing fur babies. One of them's getting a little anxious here to get out <laughs> and exercising and being healthy and making a bit of a difference some days. Like those are the things that matter, not stuff. I can't think of a better way um, to end this than that. Um, I think a wonderful goal, something I aspire to do in life is to do cool shit with fun people. And you ladies are part of that journey. And I'm so, 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 so grateful. Um, and as a bigger part of all of this, um, thank you for embarking on this journey, um, this podcast, um, as well as a small part of our journey together. This is our first time recording um, with Dalhousie University, and I just want to give a big acknowledgement to Lori, uh, Mallory, and Nicole, who are working at this behind the scenes, and to Keshev, who will do our intro. We are surrounded by amazing humans, um, and I just know that there's a lot of gratitude and a lot of um, moments that I'm really happy to have. So um, thank you, ladies, for coming out. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank Thanks, you for Sam. having us. Thanks, everybody.